Cool, brilliant, thanks. Um, so we've got quite a lot to get through, so I'm going to speak again um, like Anna pretty fast, um, but feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, what's going to happen, I'm going to speak for kind of half or two thirds of this, and I'm just going to lay out A, some of the um, problems um, that Creative Commons looks to solve, and also some of the solutions that Creative Commons is offering, some of the specific policy solutions we'd like to see in culture and heritage organisations. And then Elizabeth is going to come in at the end and talk about the licences specifically, so that's going to be the three parts. Um, but let's get started. So Creative Commons itself, we've got a fairly uh, grandiose goal, universal access to research and education and full participation in culture. Um, and there are 72 plus affiliates around the world looking to realise that goal. The two key words there are access, so we advocate for free access to works. And the second key word there is participation. So not only be able to access things, but also adapting them and reusing them um, for your own purposes. So that's the goal. We realise it in two ways. The first way is kind of the passive way, and we offer free licences that anyone can use without asking us permission or anything like this. A bunch of um, uh, well-meaning lawyers from around the world have got together and written licences for different, different jurisdictions and also for international use as well. And um, licence just means permission. So all this is a, a um, standardised, legally robust way to give permission online. Basically free legal tools for anyone to use. And Elizabeth will go into some detail about that at the end. And the second thing we do though, and this is where um, kind of the active side of our organisation is we advocate for the use of Creative Commons licensing across eight different project areas and GLAM is just one of them. So GLAM um, is that top left weird heart symbol, that's the international symbol for open GLAM, but we've also got a bunch of other projects as well in culture, government, schools, data, indigenous knowledge, um, research and education at a tertiary level too. So I won't talk about them today but just to give you a sense of the scope of the project um, and the kind of scope of what Creative Commons as an organisation is trying to achieve. Um, so I'm just going to make six or so quick points um, to kind of set the scene for why something like Creative Commons was invented in the first place, the kind of problems it looks to solve and the opportunities it looks to realise. And the first thing is really obvious, it's much easier to access New Zealand's culture and heritage. Um, I always like to plug Digital New Zealand here, but you guys are all experts on that, so we'll skip through that. The second point um, is that the technical barriers to access and reuse are dropping all the time. Um, again, that's a really, really obvious point. The third point, though, and this is what Creative Commons likes to emphasise, is that this means you can't really predict who will do exciting things with your work. We, I had an um, open research meeting um, yesterday, and I always like to point out to researchers how many people there are outside of the research community who would really want to do really interesting things with their research and data, and researchers often think about their own little research community, you know, the hundred or so people who may be experts in their field, but there are many, many thousands, many, many tens of thousands of people who will be interested in using their work, and that's not just true of the research sector, it's true of all the sectors I was talking about, um, educational resources and in the heritage sector as well. Um, a few examples of that, um, there was a really exciting project, this is not from the GLAM sector, it's just a cool project. Last um, year some um, academics and librarians in Dunedin decided to get together to solve a kind of glaring problem in the um, higher education sector at the moment which is that textbooks are A, too expensive and B, can't be adapted by the people who are teaching from them without violating copyright. So you've got a whole bunch of um, professors who are teaching from textbooks that may have been written overseas and may cost $100, $200 for their students to access in the first place. So what these academics and librarians decided to do was get together and just write in a weekend their own textbook. And they did it. They got together, um, not just in Dunedin, but they got people from um, around Australia and uh, around New Zealand um, connecting virtually to kind of write a chapter each edit each other's work, and they did it. So there's now, a, if you Google um, Media Studies 101, a Creative Commons textbook, anyone can access and download and adapt that work for their own purposes. And it's been picked up by universities in um, Canada, and it's been accessed by um, countries from around the world. So it's a really interesting and exciting project. Um, another example, a more kind of closer to home but less exciting example probably, but just to illustrate the point, we've got a video called CC Kiwi, and every now and again I go on Google, uh, go on YouTube rather, to see how many people have looked at it, just to see, you know, are people still watching this bloody video that we, that we made five years ago, and they are, but it, more interestingly, it's been translated um, into a bunch of different languages. I think there are 10 translations of CC Kiwi that exist in the, at the moment. None of the, those translations came and asked us for permission to translate that video, um, but because it was openly licensed, they were able to do so. Um, there was also a bunch of different adaptations there. Someone had decided it was too long, which is fair enough. Um, someone had decided it was too white, so they coloured it in, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. 
fair enough, we, we don't take that personally. So a lot of really exciting things happened because we released this openly and people could do what they want with it. And arguably some of this stuff wouldn't have happened if people had tried to contact us through a YouTube channel that might have been filtered out in spam, we might have been too lazy to respond, I don't know, but it might have been, they might have just not bothered to contact us in the first place. But some really cool stuff happened. Um, another thing in the research sector, there's a, I won't read these out now, but there's a lot of different groups. Um, MIT have often offered open access to a bunch of their research, and the library has been collecting stories from people who have benefited from open access to research. Um, and there's a bunch of really, really interesting stories out there from groups that you may not um, have thought of as needing access to, to research and benefiting from it. And um, the fourth point is there's an obvious potential to disseminate heritage items for reuse. Again, this is a um, fairly obvious point these days. Um, but one kind of good example of this um, is the Getty Museum. This, I'm not sure how public these figures are, but this was shared on an email list um, a, a short time after they decided to release their content openly. And when their um, collections were closed and they were essentially licensing reuse of their public domain, kind of high resolution um, scans of their public domain works, they were saying that they were licensing 121 purchases per month, um, which is like a fair amount. Um, but they kind of decided that that was going against licensing reuse of their public domain works was going against their mission as an organization. So they decided to make them openly available for anyone to download. And they got, as that says up there, 60,000 downloads in the first month, uh, which is kind of a surprisingly high number, but goes to show that you can't always predict how many people and how varied um, the groups are that will be interested in reusing your works. And the fifth point, though, so there's all these good opportunities and there's a lot of um, potential out there. But the fifth point is that the legal barriers to dissemination and reuse remain, and the one that um, Creative Commons concerns itself with is copyright. Um, I'm not going to go into the weeds, we obviously don't have, um, this conference probably doesn't have enough time to go into all the, the weeds of um, copyright, but really basically um, a lot of the problems stem from these basic facts of copyright. A, it's more restrictive than most people realise. So the more you go into copyright, the more restrictive you realise it is. Um, it's automatic, it applies online, no see required, and lasts for 50 years after death. And as many of you probably know, this causes all kinds of problems in the heritage sector because because of that last point, it lasts 50 years after death, it can be really, really hard to track down rights holders after the initial creator has died. Um, it can be really hard, again, to get permission. Um, Victoria Leachman's gonna be talking tomorrow. Um, I think she's talking next in another room as well um, about some of the things that she has to go through to find um, rights holders. It's a really, really difficult process. Um, and one, of the, one example of this, um, this is a kind of famous graph that came out um, a few years ago. Uh, someone did a study on Amazon about book availability. And you can kind of see that striking black hole in the middle of the 20th century, where once books leave commercial availability, this is a study of the amount of books you can find by searching Amazon. So book availability by decade of publication. And so once books fall from commercial circulation, they kind of go into this black hole until various people can determine that they've fallen out of copyright and then suddenly they become available again. Um, the sixth point, and this is where we're getting to kind of policy issues at heritage institutions, is that usage rights statements are often um, vague, overly restricted, and not standardised, which essentially places the burden of determining rights on materials to the end user. Now, if your end user is a, re a professional researcher who deals with these issues all the time, that's one thing. If you want teachers to comfortably reuse your work, if you want students to comfortably reuse your work, you need to be clearer about what, what kind of rights they do and don't have. And if it's unclear, it's unclear, but often the time, oftentimes it is actually clear, um, but it's not made clear enough on the usage rights statements. Um, and one glaring example of this is from the Royal Society of New Zealand. I'm allowed to say this because I used to work there. If you go online, they've digitised all the transactions and proceedings from the Royal Society of New Zealand, and if you go on and search um, some really amazing stuff from some really famous scientists, if you go to 1881, um, the key point there, you probably can't see it, so if you go into the middle of the page using this item, the usage rights of this item are currently unclear. But if you do the math, the person who wrote um, articles in the 1881 issue might have been 30, might have been born in 1850. They probably weren't alive if you go by how long people lived at the time. They probably didn't live till 1964. Would have had to be 113, right? And if they were older, they would have had to be older. So the point is that um, this really is placing the burden on someone who may or may not know anything about copyright to determine whether this item is usable legally or not. Um, and the seventh point is that many heritage institutions feel tension between um, being a kaitiaki and enabling reuse. And I think Creative Commons licensing enables institutions to do both of those things at once. Um, I don't think there should necessarily be any tension between those two um, principles. So what to do? We're, um, 
our basic um, recommendation is to start from the other direction. So instead of making everything closed, by default we argue um, across the public sector. I know this is more complicated um, in the GLAM sector because you don't often hold rights to what, uh, what's in your collections, but on principle we argue that um, items that are produced by public institutions in New Zealand should be made open by default unless there's a really good reason for them not to be. Um, more specifically though, what we're recommending in GLAM institutions is to clearly mark out of copyright works as such. So if, if work has fallen out of copyright really clearly, then tell people that it's out of copyright. It's pretty simple, but um, it's not always the case. So we argue that it should be the case for works like the, uh, the Transactions and Proceedings of the Royal Society of New Zealand. Um, second, when you get works from your communities, whoever it might be, um, from donors, give them the option of applying a Creative Commons license at the beginning, because once you have that work and once that person's gone away into the world, there might be um, 60, 70 years down the track, someone wants to do something really interesting with that work and that person's descendants are not available. It's a problem, right? And it's a problem that's easily solved at the beginning, but it becomes much, much harder to resolve the further down the line you go. Um, so again, really basic, just giving them a box to tick on the form and a, a brochure that we can give you to give them um, to start a conversation about this and the kind of problems it solves. Um, a really good example of this is um, from the Upper Hutt City Library. They've got a really rich collection of, um, of works, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was from one, one donor, right? Decided that that was a good thing. Yeah, there was one donor who had 30,000, 20,000, yeah, 20,000 photos from one donor who decided, I don't mind if you put a Creative Commons license on my work, and suddenly there's this really, really rich collection of photography from Upper Hutt City that's made available under a Creative Commons license. Um, Third, and this, this should go without saying, I think works for which the institution holds copyright use CC licensing. And that's not just, um, that could be including policy documents as well. So stuff that other institutions in the GLAM sector might find useful to repurpose. Um, there's probably an awful lot of reinventing the wheel that goes on in the GLAM sector. And I think it's a really good idea for works that are produced by institutions to be released under a CC license. And um, yeah, fourth, fourth repeats too, doesn't it? No, oh, forget that. So wait, um, what is Creative Commons licensing anyway? We're going to skip over to Elizabeth Heritage um, now. Elizabeth. Oh, kia ora, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, firstly, I should say that, yes, Heritage is my actual name. I have my driving license with me if you'd like to check. So Creative Commons licenses are free. You can just come to our website and have a look at them, download them and use them. They are absolutely legally robust and they are recognised all over the world. Uh, there's no register, you don't have to tell us that you're using them, it's not like trademarks or patents, you can just absolutely go for gold. Um, so they, they um, vary from more free to more restrictive. So in the public domain obviously there are very few restrictions and then regular, copyrighted, all rights reserved, there's, um, there's very few freedoms. So Creative Commons falls neatly into the middle there, where you can reserve, you can choose which rights you want to reserve. So there are four elements of the licenses. First one is, um, we call it BY, it's attribution, it's where you say who made the thing. The second one, NC, non-commercial, it means that you are forbidding people from making money from your work. Um, the, the third one is the uh, no derivatives license, which means that you have to reproduce the work um, absolutely as it was. So for example, you can't crop it or change the colour or change the name or that kind of thing. And the fourth part is share alike, which means that with the reuse, you have to re-license that the same way that the original work was licensed. So there are six combinations of those different elements uh, that go to make the six Creative Commons licenses. Uh, and here they, does this go through them one by one? No. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna point. So we've got up there, we've got the CCBY, which is the most open one. It's where you just have to say who made the thing. Then underneath that, we've got BYSA, which is where you have to say who made it and you have to license your work under that same license. BYNC, you have to say who made the work and you can't make money from your reuse of the work. Uh, BYND, 
uh, attribution, no derivatives. So you have to say who made the work and you can't change it when you are using it yourself. And then over here we have the more restrictive kind of licenses. Uh, BYNCSA, so these are obviously just combinations of other things. You say who made the work, you can't make money from it, and you have to relicense it with that same, same license. And then lastly, BYNCMD, you have to say who made the thing, you can't make money from it, and you have to share it uh, as it was, you can't change it. So there are three different aspects or layers to each license. There's the, the Wii symbol, which is what you will display usually. There's the human readable version of the license that sets out the terms and conditions in very clear language that everyone can understand. And then there's the lawyer readable version, which um, should hopefully keep all the lawyers happy and just um, ticks all those boxes with, with relation to copyright law as it currently stands in New Zealand and overseas. So they're, um, they're very easy to get and to use. You can just go to our website, creativecommons.org, um, and choose which ones you want, and it will walk you through those steps. And if you're looking for things to use that have been licensed under Creative Commons so that you can use them confidently, knowing that you are using a legally licensed work, you can use the, uh, the search function there on the Creative Commons, and it's got all kinds of amazing stuff and there's way more stuff than you perhaps would have thought especially if you're new to Creative Commons um, it, it, it has actually been around for a while and there's an enormous amount of resources and um, and works and artistic works and research and all kinds of cool stuff so I just wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of case studies from the New Zealand glam sector so um, right here in Te Papa, where we're very happy to be, and thank you, Te Papa, for the lovely welcome uh, this morning. Uh, Te Papa, and I'm glad that we have Victoria Leachman with us here. There she is. Um, has, they've been doing some absolutely sterling work licensing uh, images, digitizations of collection items and images under Creative Commons, um, where things are out of copyright and so forth. Uh, I would invite you all, if you haven't already, and uh, to go and look on collections online, and you'll see that there's a, a box you can tick to search just for images that are um, that can be downloaded and reused in high resolution, um, and you can just yeah use them and and follow the terms of the license and do whatever you'd like. Um, so we're getting a lot of um, very positive feedback about that, and I personally use um, the collections online a lot, especially when I'm looking for interesting images to uh, illustrate a, a blog post or um, you know, make a point in, about something or just sort of pretty up a newsletter or that kind of thing. Uh, I use that a lot. Uh, and if you were here um, just for the talk about social media earlier um, and the power of images and the power of um, really interesting shareable images, um, perhaps uh, have a look around uh, Tapapa's collections online. and see what you can do. Um, yet yeah, the other uh, project that we'd really like to celebrate is um, the, with the National Library of New Zealand, Te Puna Matauranga o Aotearoa, uh, and with the centenary of World War I. Um, there's an enormous collection of really fascinating images uh, from World War I which are now available um, and openly licensed uh, to be used. And there are some phenomenal stories uh, to be told there and they've all been beautifully digitised and, and are available for sharing and reuse so do go and check those out. Do you want to say anything further? No, no, no. no? Yeah, so um, that, that's us really. Um, there's um, huge amounts of resources on our website uh, creativecommons.org.nz um, that are particular to the New Zealand context and to the glam sector so um, please swing by. Um, we, we also run a site called nzcommons.org.nz which is more of a sort of community chatty kind of a site where people submit articles about what they've been working on and their particular experiences, for example, passing an open access policy at their institution. Um, so if you want to really get into the kind of nuts and bolts of how people have made things happen in glam organisations in New Zealand, um, 
please do swing by that site. Uh, we're on Twitter, of course, because we're really cool. Um, and we have uh, a mailing list and, and Lumio. Um, and there are our email addresses. So um, we're very, very happy to come in and talk to you and uh, answer questions and um, help you out with, with uh, any kind of licensing or copyright things that you're working on. Um, and this presentation has been licensed CCBY, so it's go forth, really. It's, it's our <laughs> gift to you. Um, but yes, we're, we're around today and tomorrow, so please do, if you spot either Matt or me, um, please do just come and ask us anything you like. Uh, is there anyone have any questions immediately? Last year, Peter Gorbals from Rights New Zealand talked about what they were doing with Peter's university. What license would apply to those papers? As far as I understand, the major terms, they digitised or scanned an enormous number of papers yeah. and said to the public effectively, these are yours, you can do whatever you like, you can take my turn. Do you know which licenses the Rights Museum used? Um, they're public domain. Yeah, I think they're yeah. public domain. Yeah. The public domain. Now, say, um, just to reiterate the basic principle is that that's how it should be as well. So institutions shouldn't be asserting rights on digitised reproductions of works that are out of copyright. That's just bad practice. Yeah. Any more? Any more? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, go forth and license everything Creative Commons. <laughs> Thank you very much.